essay eighteen of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay eighteen samuel butler diogenes of the victorians by stuart p sherman professor sherman's cold compress applied to the butler cult caused much suffering in some regions where it was said to be more than a cooling bandage in fact a wet blanket in the general rough and tumble among critical standards during recent years mr sherman is one of those who have dealt some swinging blows in favor of the victorians and the literary old guard which was often square but rarely hollow stuart pratt sherman born in iowa in 1881 graduated from williams in 1903 has been since 1911 professor of english at the university of illinois his own account of his adventures written without intended publication is worth consideration he says my life hasn't been quite as dryly academic nor as simply middle western as the record indicates for example i lived in los angeles from my fifth to my thirteenth year and then went on a seven months adventure in gold mining in the black canyon of arizona where i had some experience with drought in the desert etc that is not literary recently i've been thinking i might write a little paper about some college friends at williams i was in college with harry james smith author of mrs bumstead lee max eastman and go to hell whittlesey as editor of the williams monthly i have accepted and rejected manuscripts of both the two latter and have reminiscences of their literary youth then i spent a summer in the post and nation in nineteen o eight which is a pleasant chapter to remember another summer teaching at columbia this past summer teaching at the university of california my favorite recreations are climbing little mountains chopping wood and canoeing on lake michigan this summer i have been picking out a place to die in or rather looking over the sights offered in california i lean towards the high sierras up above the yosemite valley my ambition in life is to retire perhaps at the age of seventy and write only for amusement when i can abandon the task of improving my contemporaries i hope to become a popular author professor sherman you will note is almost an exact contemporary of h l mencken with whom he has crossed swords in more than one spirited encounter and sherman is likely to give as good as he takes in such scuffles or even rather better it is high time that his critical sagacity and powerful reasoning were better known in the market-place until i met the butlerians i used to think that the religious spirit in our times was very precious there was so little of it i thought one should hold one's breath before it as before the flicker of one's last match on a cold night in the woods what if it should go out i said but my apprehension was groundless it can never go out the religious spirit is indestructible and constant in quantity like the sum of universal energy in which matches and suns are alike but momentary sparkles and phases this great truth i learned of the butlerians though the forms and objects of religious belief wax old as a garment and are changed faith which is after all the precious thing endures for ever destroy a man's faith in god and he will worship humanity destroy his faith in humanity and he will worship science destroy his faith in science and he will worship himself destroy his faith in himself and he will worship samuel butler what makes the butlerian cult so impressive is of course that butler poor dear as the english say was the least worshipful of men he was not even till his posthumous disciples made him so a person of any particular importance one writing a private memorandum of his death might have produced something like this samuel butler was an unsociable burry crotchety obstinate old bachelor a dilettante in art and science an unsuccessful author a witty cynic of inquisitive temper and comprehensively speaking the unregarded diogenes of the victorians son of a clergyman and grandson of a bishop born in eighteen thirty five educated at cambridge 
he began to prepare for ordination but as we are told because of scruples regarding infant baptism he abandoned the prospect of holy orders and in eighteen fifty nine sailed for new zealand where with capital supplied by his father he engaged in sheep farming for five years in eighteen sixty four returning to england with eight thousand pounds he established himself for life at clifford's inn london he devoted some years to painting adored hendel and dabbled in music made occasional trips to sicily and italy and wrote a dozen books which generally fell dead from the press on religion literature art and scientific theory erewhon however a utopian romance published in eighteen seventy two had by eighteen ninety nine sold between three and four thousand copies butler made few friends and apparently never married he died in nineteen o two his last words were have you brought the check-book alfred his body was cremated and the ashes were buried in a garden by his biographer and his manservant with nothing to mark the spot butler's indifference to the disposal of his earthly part betokens no contempt for fame denied contemporary renown he had firmly set his heart on immortality and quietly persistently cannily provided for it if he could not go down to posterity by the suffrage of his countrymen he would go down by the shrewd use of his check-book he would buy his way in he bought the publication of most of the books produced in his lifetime he diligently prepared manuscripts for posthumous publication and accumulated and arranged great masses of materials for a biographer he ensured an interest in his literary remains by bequeathing them and all his copyrights to his literary executor r h straitfeld he purchased an interest in a biographer by persuading Henry Festing Jones, a feckless lawyer of Butlerian proclivities, to abandon the law and become his musical and literary companion. In return for these services, Mr. Jones received between 1887 and 1900 an allowance of £200 a year, and at Butler's death a bequest of five hundred pounds, the musical copyrights, and manifest responsibility and privilege of assisting Streetfeld with the propagation of Butler's fame, together with their own, in the next generation. These good and faithful servants performed their duties with exemplary zeal and astuteness. In 1903, the year following the master's death, streetfeld published the way of all flesh a book packed with satirical wit the first since erewhon which was capable of walking off on its own legs and exciting general curiosity about its author curiosity intensified by the announcement that the novel had been written between eighteen seventy two and eighteen eighty four in the wake of this sensation there began the systematic annual relaunching of old works with fresh introductions and memoirs and a piecemeal feeding out of other literary remains culminating in nineteen seventeen with the publication of the notebooks a skilful collection and condensation of the whole of butler's intellectual life meanwhile in nineteen o eight the erewhon dinner had been instituted in spite of mild deprecation this feast with its two toasts to his majesty and to the memory of samuel butler assumed from the outset the aspect of a solemn sacrament of believers among these was conspicuous on the second occasion mr george bernard shaw not quite certain perhaps whether he had come to give or to receive honour whether he was himself to be regarded as the beloved disciple or rather as the one for whom butler preaching in the victorian wilderness had prepared the way with free and future piercing suggestions by nineteen fourteen streetfeld was able to declare that no fragment of butler was too insignificant to publish in nineteen fifteen and nineteen sixteen appeared extensive critical studies by gilbert canan and john f harris 
in nineteen nineteen at last arrives henry festing jones with the authoritative memoir in two enormous volumes with portraits documents sumptuous index elaborate bibliography and a pious accounting to the public for the original manuscripts which have been deposited like sacred relics at st john's college the bodleian the british museum the library of congress and at various shrines in italy and sicily here are materials for a fresh consideration of the man in relation to his work the unconverted will say that such a monument to such a man is absurdly disproportionate but butler is now more than a man he is a spiritual ancestor leader of a movement moulder of young minds founder of a faith his monument is designed not merely to preserve his memory but to mark as well the present importance of the butlerian sect the memoir appears to have been written primarily for them the faithful will no doubt find it delicious and i though an outsider got through it without fatigue and with a kind of perverse pleasure in its perversity it is very instructive but it by no means simplifies its puzzling and complex subject mr jones is not of the biographers who look into the heart of a man reduce him to a formula and recreate him in accordance with it he works from the outside inward and gradually achieves life and reality by an immense accumulation of objective detail without ever plucking out or even plucking at the heart of the mystery what was the man's master passion and his master faculty butler himself did not know consequently he could not always distinguish his wisdom from his folly he was an ironist entangled in his own net and an egotist bitten with self-distrust concealing his wounds in self-assertion and his hesitancies in an external aggressiveness mr jones pierces the shell here and there but never removes it considering his opportunities he is sparing in composed studies of his subject based on his own direct observation and with all his ingenuousness and his shocking but illuminating indiscretions he is frequently silent as a tomb where he must certainly possess information for which every reader will inquire particularly those readers who do not like the butlerians accept samuel butler as the happy reincarnation of moderation common sense and fearless honesty the whole case of the georgians against the victorians might be fought out over his life and works and indeed there has already been many a skirmish in that quarter for of course neither streetfeld nor mr jones is ultimately responsible for his revival ultimately butler's vogue is due to the fact that he is a friend of the georgian revolution against idealism in the very citadel of the enemy the extraordinary acclaim with which he is now received is his reward for having long ago prepared to betray the victorians into the hands of a ruthless posterity he was a traitor to his own times and therefore it follows that he was a man profoundly disillusioned the question which we may all reasonably raise with regard to a traitor whom we have received within our lines is whether he will make us a good citizen we should like to know pretty thoroughly how he fell out with his countrymen whether through defects in his own temper and character or through a clear-eyed and righteous indignation with the incorrigible viciousness of their manners and institutions we should like to know what vision of reformation succeeded his disillusion hitherto the georgians have been more eloquent in their disillusions than in their visions and have inclined to welcome butler as a dissolving agent without much inspecting his solution the butlerians admire butler for his withering attack on family life notably in the way of all flesh and many a studious literary man with a talkative wife and eight romping children would of course admit an occasional flash of romantic envy for butler's bachelor apartments mr jones tells us that theobald and christina pontifex whose nakedness butler uncovers were drawn without exaggeration from his own father and mother his work on them is a masterpiece of pitiless satire butler appears to have hated his father despised his mother and loathed his sisters in all truth and sincerity 
he nursed his vindictive and contemptuous feelings towards them all through his life he studied these feelings made notes on them jested out of them lived in them reduced them to a philosophy of domestic antipathy he was far more learned than any other english author in the psychology of impiety when he heard someone say two are better than one he exclaimed yes but the man who said that did not know my sisters when he was forty-eight years old he wrote to a friend that his father was in poor health and not likely to recover but may hang on for months or go off with the northeast winds which we are sure to have later on in the same letter he writes that he is going to strike out forty weak pages in erewhon and stick in forty stronger ones on the trial of a middle-aged man for not having lost his father at a suitable age his father's one unpardonable offence was not dying early and so enlarging his son's income if this had been a jest it would have been a little coarse for a deathbed but mr jones who appears to think it very amusing proves clearly enough that it was not a jest but an obsession and a horrid obsession it was now a man who attacks the family because his father does not die as promptly as could be desired is not likely to propose a happy substitute his mood is not reconstructive funny though it may be in two old boys of fifty like butler and jones living along like spoiled children on allowances butler from his father jones from his mother the butlerians admire butler for his brilliant attack on romantic relations between the sexes before the advent of shaw he poured poison on the roots of that imaginative love in which all normal men and maidens walk at least once in a lifetime as in a rosy cloud shot with golden lights his portraits show a man of vigorous physique capable of passion a face distinctly virile rather harshly bearded with broad masculine eyebrows was he ever in love if not why was he not elementary questions which his biographer after a thousand pages leaves unanswered mr jones asserts that both overton and ernst in the way of all flesh are in the main accurately autobiographical and he furnishes much evidence for the point he remarks a divergence in this fact that butler unlike his hero was never in prison did butler like his hero have children and farm them out the point is of some interest in the case of a man who is helping us to destroy the conventional family mr jones leaves quite in the dark his relations with such women as the late queen victoria would not have approved relations which j b yeats has however publicly discussed mr jones is ordinarily cynical enough candid enough as we shall see he takes pains to tell us that his own grandfather was never married he does not hesitate to acknowledge abundance of moral ugliness in his subject why this access of victorian reticence at a point where plain speaking is the order of the day and the special pride of contemporary erewhonians why did a young man of butler's tastes leave the church and go into exile in new zealand for five years could a more resolute biographer perhaps find a more realistic explanation than difficulties over infant baptism mr shaw told his publisher that butler was a shy old bird in some respects he was also a sly old bird among the future piercing suggestions extolled by mr shaw we may be sure that the author of man and superman was pleased to acknowledge butler's pre-discovery that woman is the pursuer this idea we may now trace quite definitely to his relations with miss savage a witty sensible presumably virtuous woman of about his own age living in a club in london who urged him to write fiction read all his manuscripts knitted him socks reviewed his books in women's magazines and corresponded with him for years till she died without his knowledge in hospital from cancer her letters are mr jones mainstay in his first volume and she is except butler himself altogether his most interesting personality mr jones says that being unable to find any one who could authorize him to use her letters he publishes them on his own responsibility 
but he adds i cannot imagine that any relation of hers who may read her letters will experience any feelings other than pride and delight this lady he tells us was the original of alethea pontifex but he marks a difference alethea was handsome miss savage he says was short fat had hip disease and that kind of dowdiness which i used to associate with ladies who had been at school with my mother butler became persuaded that miss savage loved him this bored him and the correspondence would lapse till he felt the need of her cheery friendship again on one occasion she wrote to him i wish that you did not know wrong from right mr jones believes that she was alluding to his scrupulousness in matters of business butler himself construed the words as an overture to which he was indisposed to respond the debate on this point and the pretty uncertainty in which it is left can surely arouse in miss savage's relations no other feelings than pride and delight this brings us to the butlerian substitute for the chivalry which used to be practised by those who bore what the victorians called the grand old name of gentlemen in his later years after the death of miss savage in periods of loneliness depression and ill health butler made notes on his correspondence reproaching himself for his ill treatment of her he also says his biographer tried to express his remorse in two sonnets from which i extract some lines she was too kind wooed too persistently wrote moving letters to me day by day hard though i tried to love i tried in vain for she was plain and lame and fat and short forty and over kind tis said that if a woman woo no man should leave her till she have prevailed and true a man will yield for pity if he can but if the flesh rebel what can he do i could not hence i grieve my whole life long the wrong i did in that i did no wrong in these butlerian times one who should speak of good taste would incur the risk of being called a prig good taste is no longer in yet even now in the face of these sonnets may not one exclaim heaven preserve us from the remorseful moments of a butlerian adonis of fifty the descendants of eminent victorians may well be thankful that their fathers had no intimate relations with butler there is a familiar story of whistler that when some one praised his latest portrait as equal to velasquez he snapped back yes but why lug in velasquez butler with similar aversion for rivals but without whistler's extempore wit slowly excogitated his killing sallies and entered them in his notebooks or sent them in a letter to miss savage preserving a copy for the delectation of the next age i do not see how i can well call mr darwin the pecksniff of science though this is exactly what he is but i think i may call lord bacon the pecksniff of his age and then a little later say that mr darwin is the bacon of the victorian age to this he adds another note reminding himself to call tennyson the darwin of poetry and darwin the tennyson of science i can recall but one work of a contemporary mentioned favourably in the biography perhaps there are two the staple of his comment runs about as follows middlemarch is a long-winded piece of studied brag of john inglesant i seldom was more displeased with any book of aurora Leigh, i dislike it very much but i liked it better than mrs browning or mr either of rossetti i dislike his face and his manner and his work and i hate his poetry and his friends of george meredith no wonder if his work repels me that mine should repel him all i remember is that i disliked and distrusted morley of gladstone who was it said that he was a good man in the very worst sense of the words the homicidal spirit here exhibited may be fairly related to his anxiety for the death of his father it was on the whole characteristic of victorian freethinkers to attack christianity with reverence and discrimination in an attempt to preserve its substance while removing obstacles to the acceptance of its substance butler was voltairian 
when he did not attack mischievously like a gamin he attacked vindictively like an italian labourer whose sweetheart has been false to him i have seen it stated that he was a broad churchman and a communicant and mr jones produces a letter from a clergyman testifying to his saintliness but this must be some of mr jones fun from gibbon read on the voyage to new zealand butler imbibed he says in a letter of eighteen sixty one a calm and philosophic spirit of impartial and critical investigation in eighteen sixty two he writes for the present i renounce christianity altogether you say people must have something to believe in i can only say that i have not found my digestion impeded since i left off believing in what does not appear to be supported by sufficient evidence when in eighteen sixty five he printed his evidence for the resurrection of jesus christ the manner of his attack was impish and so was the gleeful exchange of notes between him and miss savage over the way the orthodox swallowed the bait in his notebook he wrote mead is the lowest of the intoxicants just as church is the lowest of the dissipations and caraway seed the lowest of the condiments he went to church once in eighteen eighty three to please a friend and was asked whether it had not bored him as inconsistent with his principles i said that having given up christianity i was not going to be hampered by its principles it was the substance of christianity and not its accessories of external worship that i had objected to so i went to church out of pure cussedness finally in a note of eighteen eighty nine there will be no comfortable and safe development of our social arrangements i mean we shall not get infanticide and the permission of suicide nor cheap and easy divorce till jesus christ's ghost has been laid and the best way to lay it is to be a moderate churchman robert burns was a freethinker but he wrote the cotter saturday night renan was a freethinker but he buried his god in purple matthew arnold was a freethinker but he gave new life to the religious poetry of the bible henry adams believed only in mathematical physics but he wrote of mont saint michel and chartres with chivalrous and almost catholic tenderness for the virgin for in all these diverse men there was reverence for what men have adored as their highest there was respect for a tomb even for the tomb of a god butler having transferred his faith to the bank of england diverted himself like a street arab with a slingshot by peppering the church windows he established manners for the contemporary butlerians who coming down to breakfast on christmas morning exclaim with a pleased smile well this is the birthday of the hook-nosed nazarene butler's moral note is rather attractive to young and middle-aged persons we have all sinned and come short of the glory of making ourselves as comfortable as we easily might have done his ethics is founded realistically on physiology and economics for goodness is not unless it tends towards old age and sufficiency of means pleasure dressed like a quiet man of the world is the best teacher the devil when he dresses himself in angel's clothes can only be detected by experts of exceptional skill and so often does he adopt this disguise that it is hardly safe to be seen talking to an angel at all and prudent people will follow after pleasure as a more homely but more respectable and on the whole more trustworthy guide there we have something of the tone of our genial franklin but butler is a franklin without a single impulse of franklin's wide benevolence and practical beneficence a franklin shorn of the spirit of his greatness namely his immensely intelligent social consciousness having disposed of christianity orthodox and otherwise and having reduced the morality of enlightened selfishness to its lowest terms butler turned in the same spirit to the destruction of orthodox victorian science we are less concerned for the moment with his substance than his character and manner as scientific controversialist if i cannot he wrote and i know i cannot get the literary and scientific bigwigs to give me a shilling i can and i know i can heave bricks into the middle of them 
though such professional training as he had was for the church and for painting he seems never to have doubted that his mother's wit was sufficient equipment supplemented by reading in the british museum for the overthrow of men like darwin wallace and huxley who from boyhood had given their lives to collecting studying and experimenting with scientific data i am quite ready to admit he records that i am in a conspiracy of one against men of science in general having felt himself covertly slighted in a book for which darwin was responsible he vindictively assailed not merely the work but also the character of darwin and his friends who naturally inferring that he was an unscrupulous bounder seeking notoriety generally ignored him his first contribution to evolutionary theory had been a humorous skit written in new zealand on the evolution of machines suggested by the origin of species and later included in erewhon to support this whimsy he found it useful to revive the abandoned argument from design and mother wit still working whimsically leaped to the conception that the organs of our bodies are machines thereupon he commenced serious scientific speculator and produced life and habit in eighteen seventy eight evolution old and new eighteen seventy nine unconscious memory eighteen eighty and luck or cunning eighteen eighty six the germ of all his speculations contained in his first volume is the notion of the oneness of personality existing between parents and offspring up to the time that the offspring leaves the parent's body thence develops his theory that the offspring unconsciously remembers what happened to the parents and thence his theory that a vitalistic purposeful cunning as opposed to the darwinian chance is the significant factor in evolution his theory has something in common with current philosophical speculation and it is in part as i understand a kind of adumbration a shrewd guess at the present attitude of cytologists it has thus entitled butler to half a dozen footnotes in a centenary volume on darwin but it hardly justifies his transference of darwin's laurels to button lamarck erasmus darwin and himself nor does it justify his reiterated contention that darwin was a plagiarist a fraud a pecksniff and a liar he swelled the ephemeral body of scientific speculation but his contribution to the verified body of science was negligible and the injuries that he inflicted upon the scientific spirit were considerable for their symptomatic value we must glance at butler's sallies into some other fields he held as an educational principle that it is hardly worth while to study any subject till one is ready to use it when in his fifties he wished to write music he took up for the first time the study of counterpoint mr garnett having inquired what subject butler and jones would take up when they had finished narcissus butler said that they might write an oratorio on some sacred subject and when garnet asked whether they had anything in particular in mind he replied that they were thinking of the woman taken in adultery in the same decade he cheerfully applied for the slade professorship of art at cambridge and he took credit for the rediscovery of a lost school of sculpture at the age of fifty-five he brushed up his greek which he had not wholly forgotten and read the odyssey for the purposes of his oratorio ulysses when he got to circe it suddenly flashed upon him that he was reading the work of a young woman thereupon he produced his book the authoress of the odyssey with portrait of the authoress nausicaa identification of her birthplace in sicily which pleased the sicilians and an account of the way in which she wrote her poem it was the most startling literary discovery since delia bacon burst into the silent sea on which colonel fabian of the biliteral cipher is the latest navigator that the classical scholars laughed at or ignored him did not shake his belief that the work was as important as anything he had done perhaps it was he would have remarked if any one else had written it i am a prose man he wrote to robert bridges and except homer and shakespeare he would have added nausicaa i have read absolutely nothing of english poetry and very little of english prose 
his inacquaintance with english poetry however did not embarrass him when two years after bringing out his sicilian authoress he cleared up the mysteries of shakespeare's sonnets nor did it prevent his dismissing the sceptical dr furnival after a discussion at an a b c shop as a poor old incompetent nothing said alethea pontifex speaking for her creator is well done nor worth doing unless take it all around it has come pretty easily the poor old doctor like the greek scholars and the professional men of science had blunted his wits by too much research butler maintained that every man's work is a portrait of himself and in his own case the features stand out ruggedly enough why should any one see in this infatuated pursuer of paradox a reincarnation of the pagan wisdom in his small personal affairs he shows a certain old maidish tidiness and the prudence of an experienced old bachelor who manages his little pleasures without scandal but in his intellectual life what vestige do we find of the greek or even of the roman sobriety poise and decorum in one respect butler was conservative he respected the established political and economic order but he respected it only because it enabled him without bestirring himself about his bread and butter to sit quietly in his rooms at clifford's inn and invent attacks on every other form of orthodoxy with a desire to be conspicuous only surpassed by his desire to be original he worked out the central butlerian principle videlicet the fact that all the best qualified judges agree that a thing is true and valuable establishes an overwhelming presumption that it is valueless and false with his feet firmly planted on this grand radical maxim he employed his lively wit with lawyer-like ingenuity to make out a case against family life of which he was incapable against imaginative love of which he was ignorant against chivalry otherwise the conventions of gentlemen which he had but imperfectly learned against victorian men of letters whom by his own account he had never read against altruistic morality and the substance of christianity which were repugnant to his selfishness and other vices against victorian men of science whose researches he had never imitated and against elizabethan and classical scholarship which he took up in an odd moment as one plays a game of solitaire before going to bed to his disciples he could not bequeath his cleverness but he left them his recipe for originality his manners and his assurance which has been gathering compound interest ever since in the original manuscript of alps and sanctuaries he consigned raphael along with socrates virgil the last two displaced later by plato and dante marcus aurelius antoninus goethe beethoven and another to limbo as the seven humbugs of christendom who was the unnamed seventh end of essay eighteen essay nineteen of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay nineteen bed books and night lights by h m tomlinson i shall not forget with what a thrill of delight i came upon h m tomlinson's old junk the volume of essays from which this is borrowed one feels in stumbling upon such a book much as some happy and astounded readers must have felt in eighteen seventy eight when an inland voyage came out it makes one wonder submitting one's self to the moving music and magic of that prose so simple and yet so subtle in its flavour whether poetry is not after all an inferior and more mechanic form the cool element of prose that perfect phrase of milton's comes back to mind how direct and satisfying a passage to the mind mr tomlinson's paragraphs have how they build and cumulate how the sentences shift turn and move in delicate loops and ridges under the blowing wind of thought like the sand of the dunes that he describes in one essay and through it all as intangible but as real and beautifying as moonlight 
there is the pervading brightness of a particular way of looking at the world something for which we have no catchword the illumination of a spirit at once humorous melancholy shrewd lovely and humane somehow when one is caught in the web of that exquisite considered prose the awkward symbols of speech seem transparent we come close to a man's mind in mr tomlinson's three books the sea and the jungle nineteen twelve old junk nineteen twenty and london river nineteen twenty one is revealed one of the most sincere and perfect workmen in contemporary prose h m tomlinson was born in eighteen seventy three among his early memories he records i was an office boy and a clerk among london ships in the last days of the clippers and i am forced to recall some of the things such as bookkeeping in a jam factory and stoking on a tramp steamer he joined the staff of the london morning leader in nineteen o four which was later merged with the daily news and to this journal he was attached for several years during the war he was a correspondent in france at the danger of incurring his anger should he see this i quote mr s k ratcliffe on this phase of his work one who was the friend of all a sweet and fine spirit moving untouched amid the ruin and terror expressing itself everywhere with perfect simplicity and at times with a shattering candour in nineteen seventeen he became associate editor of the london nation where if you are interested you may find his initials almost weekly the rain flashed across the midnight window with a myriad feet there was a groan in outer darkness the voice of all nameless dreads the nervous candle flame shuddered by my bedside the groaning rose to a shriek and the little flame jumped in a panic and nearly left its white column out of the corners of the room swarmed the released shadows black spectres danced in ecstasy over my bed i love fresh air but i cannot allow it to slay the shining and delicate body of my little friend the candle flame the comrade who ventures with me into the solitudes beyond midnight i shut the window they talk of the candle power of an electric bulb what do they mean it cannot have the faintest glimmer of the real power of my candle it would be as right to express in the same inverted and foolish comparison the worth of those delicate sisters the pleiades that pinch of stardust the pleiades exquisitely remote in deepest night in the profound where light all but fails has not the power of a sulphur match yet still apprehensive to the mind though tremulous on the limit of vision and sometimes even vanishing it brings into distinction those distant and difficult hints hidden far behind all our verified thoughts which we rarely properly view i should like to know of any great arc lamp which could do that so the starlight candle for me no other light follows so intimately an author's most ghostly suggestion we sit the candle and i in the midst of the shades we are conquering and sometimes look up from the lucent page to contemplate the dark hosts of the enemy with a smile before they overwhelm us as they will of course like me the candle is mortal it will burn out as the bed-book itself should be a sort of night-light to assist its illumination coarse lamps are useless they would douse the book the light for such a book must accord with it it must be like the book a limited personal mellow and companionable glow the solitary taper beside the only worshipper in a sanctuary that is why nothing can compare with the intimacy of candlelight for a bed book it is a living heart bright and warm in central night burning for us alone holding the gaunt and towering shadows at bay there the monstrous spectres stand in our midnight room the advance guard of the darkness of the world held off by our valiant little glim but ready to flood instantly and founder us in original gloom the wind moans without ancient evils are at large and wandering in torment the rain shrieks across the window for a moment for just a moment 
the sentinel candle is shaken and burns blue with terror the shadows leap out instantly the little flame recovers and merely looks at its foe the darkness and back to its own place goes the old enemy of light and man the candle for me tiny mortal warm and brave a golden lily on a silver stem almost any book does for a bed book a woman once said to me i nearly replied in a hurry that almost any woman would do for a wife but that is not the way to bring people to conviction of sin her idea was that the bed book is soporific and for that reason she even advocated the reading of political speeches that would be a dissolute act certainly you would go to sleep but in what a frame of mind you would enter into sleep with your eyes shut it would be like dying not only unshriven but in the act of guilt what book shall it shine upon think of plato or dante or tolstoy or a blue book for such an occasion i cannot they will not do they are no good to me i am not writing about you i know those men i have named are transcendent the greater lights but i am bound to confess at times they bore me though their feet are clay and on earth just as ours their stellar brows are sometimes dim in remote clouds for my part they are too big for bedfellows i cannot see myself carrying my feeble and restricted glim following in pyjamas the statuesque figure of the florentine where it stalks aloof in its garb of austere pity the sonorous deeps of hades hades not for me not after midnight let those go who like it as for the russian vast and disquieting i refuse to leave all including the blankets and the pillow to follow him into the gelid tranquillity of the upper air where even the colours are prismatic spicules of ice to brood upon the erratic orbit of the poor mud-ball below called earth i know it is my world also but i cannot help that it is too late after a busy day and at that hour to begin overtime on fashioning a new and better planet out of cosmic dust by breakfast time nothing useful would have been accomplished we should all be where we were the night before the job is far too long once the pillow is nicely set for the truth is there are times when we are too weary to remain attentive and thankful under the improving eye kindly but severe of the seers there are times when we do not wish to be any better than we are we do not wish to be elevated and improved at midnight away with such books as for the literary pundits the high priests of the temple of letters it is interesting and helpful occasionally for an acolyte to swing them a good hard one with an incense burner and cut and run for a change to something outside the rubrics midnight is the time when one can recall with ribald delight the names of all the great works which every gentleman ought to have read but which some of us have not for there is almost as much clotted nonsense written about literature as there is about theology there are few books which go with midnight solitude and a candle it is much easier to say what does not please us then than what is exactly right the book must be anyhow something benedictory by a sinning fellow-man cleverness would be repellent at such an hour cleverness anyhow is the level of mediocrity to-day we are all too infernally clever the first witty and perverse paradox blows out the candle only the sick in mind crave cleverness as a morbid body turns to drink the late candle throws its beams a great distance and its rays make transparent much that seemed massy and important the mind at rest beside that light when the house is asleep and the consequential affairs of the urgent world have diminished to their right proportions because we see them distantly from another and a more tranquil place in the heavens where duty honour witty arguments controversial logic on great questions appear such as will leave hardly a trace of fossil in the indurated mud which presently will cover them the mind then certainly smiles at cleverness 
for though at that hour the body may be dog-tired the mind is white and lucid like that of a man from whom a fever has abated it is bare of illusions it has a sharp focus small and star-like as a clear and lonely flame left burning by the altar of a shrine from which all have gone but one a book which approaches that light in the privacy of that place must come as it were with honest and open pages i like heine then though his mockery of the grave and great in those sentences which are as brave as pennants in a breeze is comfortable and sedative one's own secret and awkward convictions never expressed because not lawful and because it is hard to get words to bear them lightly seem them to be heard aloud in the mild easy and confident diction of an immortal whose voice has the blitheness of one who has watched amused and irreverent the high gods in eager and secret debate on the best way to keep the guilt and trappings on the body of the evil they have created that first-rate explorer gulliver is also fine in the light of the intimate candle have you read lately again his voyage to the whenims try it alone again in quiet swift knew all about our contemporary troubles he has got it all down why was he called a misanthrope reading that last voyage of gulliver in the select intimacy of midnight i am forced to wonder not at swift's hatred of mankind but at his satire of his fellows not at the strange and terrible nature of this genius who thought that much of us but how it is that after such a wise and sorrowful revealing of the things we insist on doing and our reasons for doing them and what happens after we have done them men do not change it does seem impossible that society could remain unaltered after the surprise its appearance should have caused it as it saw its face in that ruthless mirror we point instead to the fact that swift lost his mind in the end well that is not a matter for surprise such books and france's isle of penguins are not disturbing as bed books they resolve one's agitated and outraged soul relieving it with some free expression for the accusing and questioning thoughts engendered by the day's affairs but they do not rest immediately to hand in the bookshelf by the bed they depend on the kind of day one has had stern is closer one would rather be transported as far as possible from all the disturbances of earth's envelope of clouds and tristram shandy is sure to be found in the sun but best of all books for midnight are travel books once i was lost every night for months with doughty in the arabia deserta he is a craggy author a long course of the ordinary facile stuff such as one gets in the press every day thinking it is english sends one thoughtless and headlong among the bitter herbs and stark boulders of doughty's burning and spacious expanse only to get bewildered and the shins broken and a great fatigue at first in a strange land of fierce sun hunger glittering spar ancient plutonic rock and very adam himself but once you are acclimatized and know the language it takes time there is no more london after dark till a wanderer returned from a forgotten land you emerge from the interior of arabia on the red sea coast again feeling as though you had lost touch with the world you used to know and if that doesn't mean good writing i know of no other test because once there was a father whose habit it was to read with his boys nightly some chapters of the bible and cordially they hated that habit of his i have that book too though i fear i have it for no reason that he the rigid old faithful would be pleased to hear about he thought of the future when he read the bible i read it for the past the familiar names the familiar rhythms of its words its wonderful well-remembered stories of things long past like that of esther one of the best in english the eloquent anger of the prophets for the people when they looked as though they were alive but were really dead at heart all is solace and home to me and now i think of it it is our home and solace that we want in a bed book 
End of Essay 19essay twenty of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty the precept of peace by louise imogen guinea louise imogen guinea eighteen sixty one nineteen twenty one of the rarest poets and most delicately poised essayists this country has reared has been hitherto scantily appreciated by the omnipotent general reader her dainty spoor is perhaps too lightly trodden upon earth to be followed by the throng and yet one has faith in the imperishability of such a star-dust track this lovely and profound precept of peace is peculiarly characteristic of her and reminds one of the humorous tranquillity with which she faced the complete failure financially speaking of almost all her books there was a certain sadness in learning when the news of her death came that many of our present-day critical sanhedrim had never even become aware of her name there is no space in this brief note to do justice to her the student will refer to the newly published memoir by her friend alice brown she was born in boston in eighteen sixty one daughter of general patrick guinea who fought in the civil war from eighteen ninety four ninety seven she was postmistress in auburndale massachusetts her later years were spent in england mostly at oxford the bodleian library was a candle and she the ecstatic moth a certain sort of voluntary abstraction is the oldest and choicest of social attitudes in france where all aesthetic discoveries are made it was crowned long ago la sainte indifférence is or may be a cult and le saint indifférent an articled practitioner for the gallic mind brought up at the knee of a consistent paradox has found that not to appear concerned about a desired good is the only method to possess it full happiness is given in other words to the very man who will never sue for it this is a secret neat as that of the sphinx to go softly among events yet domineer them without fear not because we are brave but because we are exempt we bear so charmed a life that not even balder's mistletoe can touch us to harm us without solicitude for the essential thing is trained falcon-like to light from above upon our wrists and it has become with us an automatic motion to open the hand and drop what appertains to us no longer be it renown or a new hat the shorter stick of celery or the friends to whom we had no natural right the homes that were not destined to be ours it is all one let it fall away since only so by depletions can we buy serenity and a blithe mean it is diverting to study at the feet of antisthenes and of socrates his master how many indispensables man can live without or how many he can gather together make over into luxuries and so abrogate them thoreau somewhere expresses himself as full of divine pity for the mover who on may day clouds city streets with his melancholy household caravans fatal impedimenta for an immortal no furniture is clearly a superstition i have little i want nothing all my treasure is in minerva's tower not that the novice may not accumulate rather let him collect beetles and venetian interrogation marks if so be that he may distinguish what is truly extrinsic to him and bestow these toys eventually on the children of satan who clamour at the monastery gate of all his store unconsciously increased he can always part with sixteen seventeenths by way of concession to his individuality and think the subtraction so much concealing marble chipped from the heroic figure of himself he would be a donor from the beginning before he can be seen to own he will disencumber and divide strange and fearful is his discovery amid the bric-a-brac of the world that this knowledge or this material benefit is for him alone 
he would fain beg off from the acquisition and shake the touch of the intangible from his imperious wings it is not enough to cease to strive for personal favour your true indifferent is early franciscan caring not to have he fears to hold things useful need never become to him things desirable towards all commonly accounted sinecures he bears the coldest front in nature like a magician walking a maze and scornful of its flower-bordered detentions i enjoy life says seneca because i am ready to leave it meanwhile they who act with too jealous respect for their morrow of civilized comfort reap only indigestion and crow's-foot traceries for their deluded eye-corners now nothing is farther from le saint indifférent than cheap indifferentism so called the sickness of sophomores his business is to hide not to display his lack of interest in fripperies it is not he who looks languid and twiddles his thumbs for sick misplacedness like achilles among girls on the contrary he is a smiling industrious elf monstrous attentive to the canons of polite society in relation to others he knows what passes for animation and enthusiasm for at all times his character is founded on control of these qualities not on the absence of them it flatters his sense of superiority that he may thus pull wool about the ears of joint and several he has so strong a will that it can be crossed and countercrossed as by himself so by a dozen outsiders without a break in his apparent phlegm he has gone through volition and come out at the other side of it everything with him is a specific act he has no habits le saint indifferent is a dramatic white he loves to refuse your proffered six per cent when by a little haggling he may obtain three and a half for so he gets away with his own mental processes virgin it is inconceivable to you that being sane he should so comport himself amiable perhaps only by painful propulsions and sore vigilance let him appear the mere inheritor of easy good nature unselfish out of sheer pride and ever eager to claim the slippery side of the pavement or the end cut of the roast on the secret ground be it understood that he is not as capuan men who wince at trifles let him have his ironic reward in passing for one whose physical connoisseurship is yet in the raw that sympathy which his rule forbids his devoting to the usual objects he expends with some bravado upon their opposites for he would fain seem a decent partisan of some sort not what he is a bivalve intelligence troy tyriesque he is known here and there for instance as valorous in talk yet he is by nature a solitary and for the most part somewhat less communicative than the wind that sings to himself as he makes stride lonely and terrible on the andean height imagining nothing idler than words in the face of grave events he condoles and congratulates with the genteelest air in the world in short while there is anything expected of him while there are spectators to be fooled the stratagems of the fellow prove inexhaustible it is only when he is quite alone that he drops his jaw and stretches his legs then high ho arises like a smoke and envelops him becomingly the beautiful native well-bred torpidity of the gods of poetic boredom of the oxford manner how weary stale flat and unprofitable sighed hamlet of this mortal outlook as it came from him in the beginning that plaint in its sincerity can come only from the man of culture who feels about him vast mental spaces and depths and to whom the face of creation is but comparative and symbolic nor will he breathe it in the common ear where it may woo misapprehension and breed ignorant rebellion the unlettered must ever love or hate what is nearest him and for lack of perspective think his own fist the size of the sun 
the social prizes which with mellowed observers rank as twelfth or thirteenth in order of desirability such as wealth and a foothold in affairs seem to him first and sole and to them he clings like a barnacle but to our indifferent nothing is so vulgar as close suction he will never tighten his fingers on loaned opportunity he is a gentleman the hero of the habitually relaxed grasp a light unprejudiced hold on his profits strikes him as decent and comely though his true artistic pleasure is still in fallings from us vanishings it costs him little to lose and to forego to unlace his tentacles and from the many who push hard behind to retire as it were on a never guessed at competency richer than untempted kings he would not be a life prisoner in ever so charming a bower while the tranquil sabine farm is his delight well he knows that on the dark trail ahead of him even sabine farms are not sequacious thus he learns betimes to play the guest under his own cedars and with disciplinary intent goes often from them and hearing his heart-strings snap the third night he is away rejoices that he is again a freed man where his foot is planted though it root not anywhere he calls that spot home no unitarian in locality it follows that he is the best of travellers tangential merely and pleased with each new vista of the human past he sometimes wishes his understanding less that he might itch deliciously with a prejudice with cosmic congruities great and general forces he keeps all along a tacit understanding such as one has with beloved relatives at a distance and his finger airily inserted in his outer pocket is really upon the pulse of eternity his vocation however is to bury himself in the minor and immediate task and from his intent manner he gets confounded promptly and permanently with the victims of commercial ambition the true use of the much-praised lucius carey viscount falkland has hardly been apprehended he is simply the patron saint of indifference from first to last almost alone in that discordant time he seems to have heard far-off resolving harmonies and to have been rapt away with foreknowledge battle to which all knights were bred was penitential to him it was but a childish means and to what end he meanwhile and no man carried his will in better obeyance to the scheme of the universe wanted no diligence in camp or council cares sat handsomely on him who cared not at all who won small comfort from the cause which his conscience finally espoused he labored to be a doer to stand well with observers and none save his intimate friends read his agitation and profound weariness i am so much taken notice of he writes for an impatient desire for peace that it is necessary i should likewise make it appear how it is not out of fear for the utmost hazard of war and so driven from the ardour he had to the simulation of the ardour he lacked loyally daring a sacrifice to one of two transient opinions and inly impartial as a star lord falkland fell the young never-to-be-forgotten martyr of newburgh field the eminent deed he made a work of art and the station of the moment the only post of honour life and death may be all one to such a man but he will at least take the noblest pains to discriminate between tweedledum and tweedledee if he has to write a book about the variations of their antennae and like the carolian exemplar is the disciple the indifferent is a good thinker or a good fighter he is no immartial minion as dear old chapman suffers hector to call tydides nevertheless his sign manual is content with humble and stagnant conditions talk of scaling the himalayas of life effects him very palpably as paul talk he deals not with things but with the impressions and analogies of things the material counts for nothing with him he has moulted it away 
not so sure of the identity of the higher course of action as he is of his consecrating dispositions he feels that he may make heaven again out of sundries as he goes shall not a beggarly duty discharged with perfect temper land him in the outcourts of glory quite as successfully as a grand sunday school excursion to front the cruel paynim foe he thinks so experts have thought so before him francis drake with the national alarum instant in his ears desired first to win at bowls on the devon sward and afterwards to settle with the don no one will claim a buccaneering hero for an indifferent however the jesuit novices were ball-playing almost at that very time three hundred years ago when some too speculative companion figuring the end of the world in a few moments with just leisure enough between to be shriven in chapel according to his own thrifty mind asked louis of gonzaga how he on his part should employ the precious interval well, i should go on with the game said the most innocent and most ascetic youth among them but to cite the behaviour of any of the saints is to step over the playful line allotted indifference of the mundane brand is not to be confounded with their detachment which is emancipation wrought in the soul and the ineffable efflorescence of the christian spirit like most supernatural virtues it has a laic shadow the counsel to abstain and to be unsolicitous is one not only of perfection but also of polity a very little non-adhesion to common affairs a little reserve of unconcern and the gay spirit of sacrifice provide the moral immunity which is the only real estate the indifferent believes in storms since tales of shipwreck encompass him but once among his own kind he wonders that folk should be circumvented by merely extraneous powers his favourite catch woven in among escaped dangers arises through the roughest weather and daunts it now strike your sails ye jolly mariners for we come into a quiet road no slave to any vicissitude his imagination is on the contrary the cheerful obstinate tyrant of all that is he lives as keats once said of himself in a thousand worlds withdrawing at will from one to another often curtailing his circumference to enlarge his liberty his universe is a universe of balls like those which the cunning oriental carvers make out of ivory each entire surface perforated with the same delicate pattern each moving prettily and inextricably within the other and all but the outer one impossible to handle in some such innermost asylum the right sort of daredevil sits smiling while men rage or weep End of Essay 20essay twenty one of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty one on lying awake at night by stuart edward white this is from the forest one of stuart edward white's many delightful volumes a very large public has enjoyed mr white's writings many of his readers perhaps without accurately realizing how extraordinarily good they are mr white was born in grand rapids michigan eighteen seventy three studied at the university of michigan has hunted big game in africa served as major of field artillery nineteen seventeen eighteen and is a fellow of the royal geographical society his first book the westerners was published in nineteen o one since when they have followed regularly who hath lain alone to hear the wild goose cry about once in so often you are due to lie awake at night why this is so i have never been able to discover it apparently comes from no predisposing uneasiness of indigestion no rashness in the matter of too much tea or tobacco no excitation of unusual incident or stimulating conversation in fact you turn in with the expectation of rather a good night's rest 
almost at once the little noises of the forest grow larger blend in the hollow bigness of the first drowse your thoughts drift idly back and forth between reality and dream when snap you are broad awake perhaps the reservoir of your vital forces is full to the overflow of a little waste or perhaps more subtly the great mother insists thus that you enter the temple of her larger mysteries for unlike mere insomnia lying awake at night in the woods is pleasant the eager nervous straining for sleep gives way to a delicious indifference you do not care your mind is cradled in an exquisite poppy suspension of judgment and of thought impressions slip vaguely into your consciousness and as vaguely out again sometimes they stand stark and naked for your inspection sometimes they lose themselves in the mist of half-sleep always they lay soft velvet fingers on the drowsy imagination so that in their caressing you feel the vaster spaces from which they have come peaceful brooding your faculties receive hearing sight smell all are preternaturally keen to whatever of sound and sight and woods perfume is abroad through the night and yet at the same time active appreciation dozes so these things lie on it sweet and cloying like fallen rose leaves in such circumstance you will hear what the voyageurs call the voices of the rapids many people never hear them at all they speak very soft and low and distinct beneath the steady roar and dashing beneath even the lesser tinklings and gurglings whose quality superimposes them over the louder sounds they are like the tear forms swimming across the field of vision which disappear so quickly when you concentrate your sight to look at them and which reappear so magically when again your gaze turns vacant in the stillness of your hazy half-consciousness they speak when you bend your attention to listen they are gone and only the tumults and the tinklings remain but in the moments of their audibility they are very distinct just as often an odor will wake all a vanished memory so these voices by the force of a large impressionism suggest whole scenes far off are the cling clang cling of chimes and the swell and fall murmur of a multitude en fête so that subtly you feel the grey old town with its walls the crowded market-place the decent peasant crowd the booths the mellow church building with its bells the warm dust-moted sun or in the pauses between the swish dash dashings of the waters sound faint and clear voices singing intermittently calls distant notes of laughter as though many canoes were working against the current only the flotilla never gets any nearer nor the voices louder the voyageurs call these mist people the huntsmen and look frightened to each is his vision according to his experience the nations of the earth whisper to their exiled sons through the voices of the rapids curiously enough by all reports they suggest always peaceful scenes a harvest field a street fair a sunday morning in a cathedral town careless travellers never the turmoils and struggles perhaps this is the great mother's compensation in a harsh mode of life nothing is more fantastically unreal to tell about nothing more concretely real to experience than this undernote of the quick water and when you do lie awake at night it is always making its unobtrusive appeal gradually its hypnotic spell works the distant chimes ring louder and nearer as you cross the borderland of sleep and then outside the tent some little woods noise snaps the thread an owl hoots a whippoorwill cries a twig cracks beneath the cautious prowl of some night creature at once the yellow sunlight french meadows puff away you are staring at the blurred image of the moon spraying through the texture of your tent the voices of the rapids have dropped into the background as have the dashing noises of the stream through the forest is a great silence but no stillness at all 
the whippoorwill swings down and up the short curve of his regular song over and over an owl says his rapid whoo 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 these with the ceaseless dash of the rapids are the web on which the night traces her more delicate embroideries of the unexpected distant crashes single and impressive stealthy footsteps near at hand the subdued scratching of claws a faint sniff 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 of inquiry the sudden clear tin horn co 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 ho of the little owl the mournful long drawn out cry of the loon instinct with the spirit of loneliness the ethereal call note of the birds of passage high in the air of patter 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 among the dead leaves immediately stilled and then at the last from the thicket close at hand the beautiful silver purity of the white-throated sparrow the nightingale of the north trembling with the ecstasy of beauty as though a shimmering moonbeam had turned to sound and all the while the blurred figure of the moon mounting to the ridge line of your tent these things combine subtly until at last the great silence of which they are a part overarches the night and draws you forth to contemplation no beverage is more grateful than the cup of spring water you drink at such a time no moment more refreshing than that in which you look about you at the darkened forest you have cast from you with the warm blanket the drowsiness of dreams a coolness physical and spiritual bathes you from head to foot all your senses are keyed to the last vibrations you hear the littler night prowlers you glimpse the greater a faint searching woods perfume of dampness greets your nostrils and somehow mysteriously in a manner not to be understood the forces of the world seem in suspense as though a touch might crystallize infinite possibilities into infinite power and motion but the touch lacks the forces hover on the edge of action unheeding the little noises in all humbleness and awe you are a dweller of the silent places at such a time you will meet with adventures one night we put fourteen inquisitive porcupines out of camp near mcgregor's bay i discovered in the large grass park of my camp site nine deer cropping the herbage like so many beautiful ghosts a friend tells me of a fawn that every night used to sleep outside his tent and within a foot of his head probably by way of protection against wolves its mother had in all likelihood been killed the instant my friend moved toward the tent opening the little creature would disappear and it was always gone by earliest daylight nocturnal bears in search of pork are not uncommon but even though your interest meets nothing but the bats and the woods shadows and the stars that few moments of the sleeping world forces is a psychical experience to be gained in no other way you cannot know the night by sitting up she will sit up with you only by coming into her presence from the borders of sleep can you meet her face to face in her intimate mood the night wind from the river or from the open spaces of the wilds chills you after a time you begin to think of your blankets in a few moments you roll yourself in their soft wool instantly it is morning and strange to say you have not to pay by going through the day unrefreshed you may feel like turning in at eight instead of nine and you may fall asleep with unusual promptitude but your journey will begin clear-headedly proceed springily and end with much in reserve no languor no dull headache no exhaustion follows your experience for this once your two hours of sleep have been as effective as nine end of essay twenty one essay twenty two of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty two a woodland valentine by marion storm 
Marion Storm was born in Stormville, New York, and educated at Penn Hall, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and at Smith College. She did editorial and freelance work in New York after graduation, and later went to Washington to become private secretary to the Argentine ambassador. Since 1918, she has been connected with the New York Evening Post. This essay comes from Minstrel Weather, a series of open-air vignettes which circle the zodiac with the attentive eye of a naturalist and the enchanted ardor of a poet. Forces astir in the deepest roots grow restless beneath the lock of frost. Bulbs try the door. February stillness is charged with a faint anxiety, as if the powers of light, pressing up from the earth's center and streaming down from the stronger sun, had troubled the buried seeds who strive to answer their liberator, so that the guarding mother must whisper over and over, Not yet, not yet better to stay behind the frozen gate than to come too early up into realms where the wolves of cold are still a prowl wisely the snow places a white hand over eager life unseen but perceived in february's woods as a swimmer feels the changing moods of water in a lake fed by springs only the thick stars, closer and more companionable than in months of foliage, burn alert and serene. In February the Milky Way is revealed divinely lucent to lonely peoples, herdsmen, mountaineers, fishermen, trappers, who are abroad in the starlight hours of this grave and silent time of year. It is in the long frozen nights that the sky has most red flowers february knows the beat of twilight wings drifting north again come birds who only pretended to forsake us adventurers not so fond of safety but that they dare risk finding how snow bunting and pine finch have plundered the cones of the evergreens while chickadees sparrows and crows are supervising from established stations all the more domestic supplies available a sparrow often making it possible to annoy even a duck out of her share of cracked corn ranged along a brown draped oak branch in the waxing light crows show a lordly glistening of feathers sun on a sweeping wing in flight has the quality of sun on a ripple where hemlocks gather deep in sombre woods the great horned owl has thus soon perhaps working amid snows at her task built a nest wherein march will find sturdy balls of fluff the thunderous love-song of her mate sounds through the timber by the time the wren has nested these winter babies will be solemn with the wisdom of their famous race there is no season like the end of february for cleaning out brooks hastening yellow waters toss a dreary wreckage of torn or ashen leaves twigs acorn cups stranded rafts of bark and button balls from the sycamore never to come to seed standing on one bank or both according to the sundering flood's ambition the knight with staff and bold forefinger sets the water princess free she goes then curtsying and dimpling over the shining gravel sliding from beneath the ice that roofs her on the uplands down to the softer valleys where her quickened step will be heard by the frogs in their mansions of mud and the fish recluses in rayless pools will rise to the light she brings down from the frozen mountains in summer birds and winds must bear the seed of alpine flowers lilies that lean against unmelting snows poppies bright-colored herbs and the palely gleaming fringed beauties that change names with countries how just and reasonable it would seem to be that flowers which edge the ice in july should consent to bloom in lowlands no colder in february the pageant of blue magenta and scarlet on the austere upper slopes of the rockies where nights are bitter to the summer wanderer why should it not flourish to leeward of a valley barn in months when icicles hang from the eaves in this tamer setting but no 
mountain tempests are endurable to the silken petaled the treacherous lowland winter with its coaxing suns followed by roaring desolation is for blooms bred in a different tradition the light is clear but hesitant a delicate wine by no means the mighty vintage of april february has no intoxication the vague eagerness that gives the air a pulse where fields lie voiceless comes from the secret stirring of imprisoned life spring and sunrise are forever miracles but the early hour of the wonder hardly hints the exuberance of its fulfilment even the forest dwellers move gravely thankful for any promise of kindness from the lord of day as he hangs above a sea-gray landscape but knowing well that their long duress is not yet to end deer pathetically haunt the outskirts of farms gazing upon cattle feeding in winter pasture from the stack and often after dark clearing the fences and robbing the same dishevelled storehouse not a chipmunk winks from the top rail the woodchuck after his single expeditionary effort on candlemas which he is obliged to make for mankind's enlightenment has retired without being seen in sunshine or shadow and has not the slightest intention of disturbing himself just yet though snowdrops may feel uneasy he knows too much about the ides of march quietest of all northern woods creatures the otter slides from one ice-hung waterfall to the next the solitary scamperer left is the cottontail appealing because he is the most pursued and politest of the furry faithfully trying to give no offence except when starvation points to winter cabbage he is none the less fay so is the mink though he moves like a phantom mosses whereon march in coming treads first show one hue brighter in the swamps pussy willows have made a gray dawn in viny caverns where the day's own dawn looks in but faintly and the flushing of the red willow betrays reveries of a not impossible cowslip upon the bank beneath the blue jay has mentioned it in the course of his voluble recollections he is unwilling to prophesy arbutus but he will just hint that when the leaves in the woodlot show through snow as early as this once he found a hepatica bud the last day of february speaking with his old friend the muskrat last week and when you can see red pebbles in the creek at five o'clock in the afternoon but it is no use to expect yellow orchids on the west knoll this spring for some people found them there last year and after that you might as well well of course cowslips beside red willows are remarkably pretty just as blue jays in a cedar with blue berries he is interminable but then he has seen a great deal of life and february needs her blue jays unwearied and conquering faith End of Essay 22essay twenty three of modern essays selected by christopher morley this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty three the elements of poetry by george santayana george santayana was born in madrid in eighteen sixty three of spanish parentage he graduated from harvard in eighteen eighty six and taught philosophy there eighteen eighty nine to nineteen eleven he lives now i think in england i must be frank except his poems i only know his work in that enthralling volume little essays drawn from the writings of george santayana edited by l pearsall smith much of it is too esoteric for my grasp but mr smith's redaction brings the fascination of santayana's philosophy within the compass of what tennyson called a second-rate sensitive mind and if mine is a criterion such will find it of the highest stimulus this discourse on poetry seems to me one of the most pregnant utterances on the subject it is not perfectly appreciated by merely one reading but even if you have to become a poet to enjoy it fully that will do yourself least harm 
if poetry in its higher reaches is more philosophical than history because it presents the memorable types of men and things apart from unmeaning circumstances so in its primary substance and texture poetry is more philosophical than prose because it is nearer to our immediate experience poetry breaks up the trite conceptions designated by current words into the sensuous qualities out of which those conceptions were originally put together we name what we conceive and believe in not what we see things not images souls not voices and silhouettes this naming with the whole education of the senses which it accompanies subserves the uses of life in order to thread our way through the labyrinth of objects which assault us we must make a great selection in our sensuous experience half of what we see and hear we must pass over as insignificant while we piece out the other half with such an ideal complement as is necessary to turn it into a fixed and well-ordered conception of the world this labor of perception and understanding this spelling of the material meaning of experience is enshrined in our workaday language and ideas ideas which are literally poetic in the sense that they are made for every conception in an adult mind is a fiction but which are at the same time prosaic because they are made economically by abstraction and for use when the child of poetic genius who has learned this intellectual and utilitarian language in the cradle goes afield and gathers for himself the aspects of nature he begins to encumber his mind with the many living impressions which the intellect rejected and which the language of the intellect can hardly convey he labors with his nameless burden of perception and wastes himself in aimless impulses of emotion and reverie until finally the method of some art offers a vent to his inspiration or to such part of it as can survive the test of time and the discipline of expression the poet retains by nature the innocence of the eye or recovers it easily he disintegrates the fictions of common perception into their sensuous elements gathers these together again into chance groups as the accidents of his environment or the affinities of his temperament may conjoin them and this wealth of sensation and this freedom of fancy which make an extraordinary ferment in his ignorant heart presently bubble over into some kind of utterance the fullness and sensuousness of such effusions bring them nearer to our actual perceptions than common discourse could come yet they may easily seem remote overloaded and obscure to those accustomed to think entirely in symbols and never to be interrupted in the algebraic rapidity of their thinking by a moment's pause and examination of heart nor ever to plunge for a moment into that torrent of sensation and imagery over which the bridge of prosaic associations habitually carries us safe and dry to some conventional act how slight that bridge commonly is how much an affair of trestles and wire we can hardly conceive until we have trained ourselves to an extreme sharpness of introspection but psychologists have discovered what laymen generally will confess that we hurry by the procession of our mental images as we do by the traffic of the street intent on business gladly forgetting the noise and movement of the scene and looking only for the corner we would turn or the door we would enter yet in our alertest moment the depths of the soul are still dreaming the real world stands drawn in bare outline against a background of chaos and unrest our logical thoughts dominate experience only as the parallels and meridians make a checkerboard of the sea they guide our voyage without controlling the waves which toss forever in spite of our ability to ride over them to our chosen ends sanity is a madness put to good uses waking life is a dream controlled out of the neglected riches of this dream the poet fetches his wares 
he dips into the chaos that underlies the rational shell of the world and brings up some superfluous image some emotion dropped by the way and reattaches it to the present object he reinstates things unnecessary he emphasizes things ignored he paints in again into the landscape the tints which the intellect has allowed to fade from it if he seems sometimes to obscure a fact it is only because he is restoring an experience the first element which the intellect rejects in forming its ideas of things is the emotion which accompanies the perception and this emotion is the first thing the poet restores he stops at the image because he stops to enjoy he wanders into the bypass of association because the bypaths are delightful the love of beauty which made him give measure and cadence to his words the love of harmony which made him rhyme them reappear in his imagination and make him select there also the material that is itself beautiful or capable of assuming beautiful forms the link that binds together the ideas sometimes so wide apart which his wit assimilates is most often the link of emotion they have in common some element of beauty or of horror. End of Essay 23 Essay 24 of Modern Essays, selected by Christopher Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 24, Nocturne, by Simeon Strunsky simeon strunsky is one of the most brilliant and certainly the most modest of american journalists i regret that i cannot praise him for at present we both work in the same office and kind words uttered in public would cause him to avoid me forever all that is necessary is for my readers to examine his books and they will say for themselves what i am restrained from hinting there is a spontaneous play of chaff in mr strunsky's lighter vein which is unsurpassed by any american humorist his more inward musing is well exemplified by this selection from post impressions nineteen fourteen if you read post impressions the patient observer belshazzar court professor latimer's progress and sinbad and his friends you will have made a fair start strunsky was born in russia in eighteen seventy nine studied at the horace mann high school new york and graduated from columbia university in nineteen hundred he worked on the staff of the new international encyclopedia in nineteen hundred to nineteen o six and since then has been on the staff of the new york evening post of which he is now editor once every three months with fair regularity she was brought into the night court found guilty and fine she came in between eleven o'clock and midnight when the traffic of the court is at its heaviest and it would be an hour perhaps before she was called to the bar when her turn came she would rise from her seat at one end of the prisoner's bench and confront the magistrate her eyes did not reach to the level of the magistrate's desk a policeman in citizen's clothes would mount the witness stand take oath with a seriousness of mien which was surprising in view of the frequency with which he was called upon to repeat the formula and testify in an illiterate drone to a definite infraction of the law of the state committed in his presence and with his encouragement while he spoke the magistrate would look at the ceiling when she was called upon to answer she defended herself with an obvious lie or two while the magistrate looked over her head he would then condemn her to pay the sum of ten dollars to the state and let her go she came to look forward to her visits at the night court the night court is no longer a centre of general interest during the first few months after it was established two or three years ago it was one of the great sights of a great city for the newspapers it was a rich source of human interest stories it replaced chinatown in its appeal to visitors from out of town 
it stirred even the languid pulses of the native inhabitant with its offerings of something new in the way of life the sociologists sincere and amateur crowded the benches and took notes Today the novelty is worn off the newspapers long ago abandoned the night court clergymen go to it rarely for their texts and the tango has taken its place but the sociologists and the casual visitors have not disappeared serious people anxious for an immediate vision of the pity of life continue to fill the benches comfortably no session of the court is without its little group of social investigators among whom the women are in the majority many of them are young women exceedingly sympathetic handsomely gowned and very well taken care of as she sat at one end of the prisoner's bench waiting her turn before the magistrate's desk she would cast a sidelong glance over the railing that separated her from the handsomely gowned gently bred sympathetic young women in the audience she observed with extraordinary admiration and delight those charming faces softened in pity the graceful bearing the admirably constructed yet simple coiffures the elegance of dress which she compared with the best that the windows in sixth avenue could show she was amazed to find such gowns actually being worn instead of remaining as an unattainable ideal on smiling lay figures in the shop windows occupants of the prisoner's bench are not supposed to stare at the spectators she had to steal a glance now and then her visits to the night court had become so much a matter of routine that she would venture a peep over the railing while the case immediately preceding her own was being tried once or twice she was surprised by the clerk who called her name she stood up mechanically and faced the magistrate as officer smith in civilian clothes mounted the witness stand she had no grudge against officer smith she did not visualize him either as a person or as a part of a system he was merely an incident of her trade she had neither the training nor the imagination to look behind officer smith and see a communal policy which has not the power to suppress nor the courage to acknowledge nor the skill to regulate and so contents itself with sending out full-fed policemen in civilian clothes to work up the evidence that defends society against her kind through the imposition of a ten-dollar fine to some of the women on the visitors benches the cruelty of the process came home this business of setting a two hundred pound policeman in citizens clothes backed up by magistrates clerks court criers interpreters and court attendants to worrying a ten dollar fine out of a half-grown woman under an enormous imitation ostrich plume the professional sociologists were chiefly interested in the money cost of this process to the taxpayer and they took notes on the proportion of first offenders yet the night court is a remarkable advance in civilization formerly in addition to her fine the prisoner would pay a commission to the professional purveyor of bail sometimes if the magistrate was young or new to the business she would be given a chance against officer smith she would be called to the witness chair and under oath be allowed to elaborate on the obvious lies which constituted her usual defence this would give her the opportunity between the magistrate's questions of sweeping the courtroom with a full hungry look for as much as half a minute at a time she saw the women in the audience only and their clothes the pity in their eyes did not move her because she was not in the least interested in what they thought but in how they looked and what they wore they were part of a world which she would read about she read very little in the society columns of the sunday newspaper they were the women around whom headlines were written and whose pictures were printed frequently on the first page she could study them with comparative leisure in the night court outside in the course of her daily routine she might catch an occasional glimpse of these same women through the windows of a passing taxi or in the matinee crowds or going in and out of the fashionable shops but her work took her seldom into the region of taxicabs and fashionable shops
the nature of her occupation kept her to furtive corners and the dark side of streets nor was she at such times in the mood for just appreciation of the beautiful things in life more than any other walk of life hers was of an exacting nature calling for intense powers of concentration both as regards the public and the police it was different in the night court here having nothing to fear and nothing out of the usual to hope for she might give herself up to the aesthetic contemplation of a beautiful world of which at any other time she could catch mere fugitive aspects sometimes i wonder why people think that life is only what they see and hear and not what they read of take the night court the visitor really sees nothing and hears nothing that he has not read a thousand times in his newspaper and had it described in greater detail and with better trained powers of observation than he can bring to bear in person what new phase of life is revealed by seeing in the body say a dozen practitioners of a trade of whom we know there are several tens of thousands in new york they have been described by the human interest reporters, analyzed by the statisticians, defended by the social revolutionaries, and explained away by the optimists. For that matter, to the faithful reader of the newspapers, daily and Sunday, what can there be new in this world from the pyramids by moonlight to the habits of the night prowler? can the upper classes really acquire for themselves through slumming parties and visits to the night court anything like the knowledge that books and newspapers can furnish them can the lower classes ever hope to obtain that complete view of the fifth avenue set which the sunday columns offer them and yet there the case stands only by seeing and hearing for ourselves however imperfectly do we get the sense of reality that is why our criminal courts are probably our most influential schools of democracy more than our settlement houses more than our subsidized dancing schools for shop girls they encourage the get-together process through which one half of the world learns how the other half lives on either side of the railing of the prisoner's cage is an audience and a stage that is why she would look forward to her regular visits at the night court she saw life there end of essay twenty four